Hello, hello. So where is Mogyan High School? They're on their way. They're talking to her now. Oh, okay. You'll be here any second. Any second, okay. Thank you. All right, so let's see. So is Skylar there, Chloe? Um, she might be coming in, but I'm not sure. Okay, thanks. All right, so we got a couple of people there. So I hope you all had a good Thanksgiving. Anybody do anything amazing over the Thanksgiving break? I went to Denver, Colorado and saw a Monet exhibit. Yeah. Oh yeah? Did you bid on it? No. No? It's, so we just went and saw a bunch of paintings in a museum and it's really rare experience because Monet is mostly European. But that right. was fun to go on to the Yeah, well I actually we have some Monet prints in our house, so my wife I like Monet. Um, but uh, anyway, she's a big fan. So that's very cool. Oh, there's Skylar. All right. Uh, let's see. Anyone missing in Mogollon? Is Denon coming? Yeah, No, Dan. He's, he's gone. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, So just a couple of things before we get started here today. Um, uh, we're, we're on 5.3. And um, so uh, remember, I, I can't remember who was all gone last week, but on Tuesday, but I said I was going to give everybody five points extra credit on the tests because uh, you guys are, I'm thankful for you, right? So, um, no, because I, I was just really impressed with how everybody uh, comported their way uh, last Monday. So I appreciate that. So that's just my way of saying thank you is, uh, so just, it'll add to your, your, your pile of test points. Um, let's see, what else? Um, I did get all caught up on the videos, and so even up through last week, so I know a couple of you were gone a day or two last week, all of the videos up through today have been posted, so you should be able to find anything that you need. Uh, again, if it's a school absence, shoot me an email so I can adjust your attendance. I think I still need uh, to do that for Hannah. Um, all right, let's see what else. Um, okay, on the quizzes. Okay, so so here's the deal. Is that uh, this week we will probably be able to finish um, chapter five or you know, early next week, all right? But I want to tell you right now that chapter six, we're, it's going to be a little different in that um, it's just, what I'm going to do is just give you formulas and we're, I'm going to show you how to use, put those formulas in the calculator, okay? So chapter six is all about, um, you learning how to put the things in the calculator and applying what we're going to be doing this week and next week. So it's kind of the same thing, but it's there. It's pretty uh, calculator intensive. So chapter six. So as we go and we learn how to do do things more and more in the calculator, it's going to help you with chapter six. Now what I'm going to do is with chapter six because it's, you know, it's right here at the end, is that I, there's no, there's going to be no quizzes after chapter five. 
So probably the material this week, early next week, and then no more quizzes. Okay. Then chapter six, there, so there are no quizzes at all. And then the chapter six test, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to kind of treat it in a sense like an extra credit test in that what I'm going to drop your lowest test. So if you decide that chapter six, you don't even have to take it. All right. So if you don't even want to take it and you get a zero, it will not hurt your grade. But let's say you have one test that you got uh, 60 on it and you take the chapter six test and you get higher than that, then I'll drop your other test. OK, so chapter six, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. So but it's it's so this chapters on integrals, chapter six is on application of integrals, specifically calculator stuff. Okay, so I'm teaching you the theory here in chapter five, and then chapter six, I'll show you how to use the technology. So that's kind of the what what we have left. Okay. Um, all right, and then um, so two, we have really, so two weeks from today is the last day of class. So what that's going to be is the final exam part two is two weeks from today, the 16th. That's the last day of NPC's class. So the Thursday before on the 12th, that's going to be final exam part one. Okay. So the last two days of class, Thursday the 12th, and then Monday the 16th, that's when we will have our two days of, of finals for this class. Okay. All right. And then um, I think what I'll do is, um, well, do you want to hear about extra credit today or would you wait to just want to hear about that tomorrow? Today. Today. Okay. So, um, some extra credit uh, uh, possibilities. Okay. Um, okay. The first thing is, well, okay, there is a survey that's been uploaded on the Moodle. And I'm, I'm going to, I don't want you to do the survey today or whatever, but it's just one of those click, click, deals and it'll take you like 30 seconds and that's going to give you five points on your quizzes okay and i'm going to show you how to get it but but that's that's going to be one quick and easy deal all right then on your final and and i'm going to give you more information but i'm going to just let you know that this is going to be out there okay i'm also going to ask if you will write a one page essay evaluation of the class of my teaching the Moodle whatever so you type up a one-page evaluation and you get it to me by that last day of class and then what that's gonna that I really is super important to me that and I want to hear from everybody and so I'm actually going to give you five points on your overall uh, final exam grade. Okay. And that's after the curve. So like if, if the curve, if, if you get a 90 on the final and the curve is five, then you're going to end up with a hundred on the final because you'll get the curve plus five points. Okay. So, um, so five points on the, on the final exam. Uh, if you do a one page evaluation of your class. Okay. So I'm going to, I'll give you more details on that as well. Um, let's see. What was the other thing? Um, oh, and then the test. Okay. So the chapter six test that will replace your lowest score. The the 
little survey and then the evaluation. That's kind of what, what's come up here. Okay? All right, any questions on any of that? Okay, so I, I'll, give, I'll be giving you more information on, on all of that. All right, well, so today what we're going to do, so, so, so what we have left as far, just so you know, so we have left to teach you Chapter 5. And then Chapter 6, I'm going to go through and teach you some of the formulas. We're not really going to do Chapter 6 like any other chapter. Is we're just going to be focusing on, okay, this formula, this is how we're going to use it, and so on. So Chapter 6 is going to be a little weird. All right, but chapter five, we are on 5.3. And um, okay, so let's, let's get started on that. Any other questions or comments, concerns before we get started? Oh, and then, okay, and then I said I was going to give you five points, five quiz points for your, um, for last week. Let me write that down so I don't forget. Okay. Oh, so let's see. The, I've been having a little trouble with the board here today. So let me just see if it's working before I change the camera. Okay. We're good. Okay. All right, so, um, okay, so the, the camera in Holbrook is kind of messed up. I'm not sure what's going on. So, um, so I just have to ask, can you all see me and the board? We're all good there? Okay, because I, I can't tell if it's working right. Okay, so part one, integrable and non-integrable functions. Okay, so the... First kind of term that I want to talk about is uh, Riemann sums. Okay, the Riemann sums is when what we what we did in five point one, where we were adding together the areas of the rectangles. Okay, so the limit of the Riemann sums, so adding the area of the rectangle as the norm. Now the norm. From last, from 5.2, was the biggest of the widths. So as the norm approaches zero, leads to the, in, the, leads to the definite integral. So... Remember, we, we were talking about like the summations and we had the function and so on, okay? Um, see, this is now, uh, this is what goes under the, uh, uh, to practice zero, write and label the parts of the definite integral. So this is the definite integral right here, okay? So you have the function is called the integrand. And then dx is the variable of integration. And then you have the integral sign, which is the elongated s. The lower limit of integration goes down here at the bottom. The upper limit of integration goes at the top. And so this is what we say called the integral from a to b.
all right? Okay, so if, okay, so if we want to take this, this limit of the summation, kind of what we were doing at the end of uh, 5.2, what we want to do is just rewrite this in integral notation. So we're not evaluating this. We're not coming up with the answer. We're just going to say, all right, to say the limit of the sum as P goes from 1 to infinity, as the norm of the, the, uh, of the partitions approach 0, okay, all of that just means the integral, okay? So all of that we would just translate as the integral sign, okay? Then when we have the interval from negative 1 to 0, we put the lower limit on the bottom, so negative 1 to 0, and then you put the function. So 2 c sub k cubed, that's just like 2x cubed. And then the delta x in integral notation just becomes dx. And so all of this in integral notation just means this. So yeah, we're summing up inter rectangles, but this is a little cleaner, a little clearer way to write it. Okay? All right? So see if you can do that for practice one. So we're not evaluating anything. We're just rewriting this limit of the summation as and using the integral sign. All right, so Hannah Z, what do you think would be the integral for the, all of this? How would you rewrite that as an integral? Integral from three to or from negative two to three x squared plus five x dx. Yep, that's it. Okay, so a couple of things. So you say from negative two to three, you started to say three to negative two, and then you corrected yourself. And that's good, because it's always this the lower limit to the upper limit. And then when you write it, make sure you have parentheses around all of that. Because this is like the dx is like the width of the rectangle, and then the height is the function. Okay? So it's length times width. Okay? Good job. Okay. So now, um, okay, so the rules. Uh, now, if you, when, the properties of the definite integrals, you can either write down in words or you can write down in symbols uh, or you could do both if you want. Normally, well, anyway, let me just explain what each one says. Is that, okay, if you change the limits of integration, so here on this one, it goes from B to A. If you change it from A to B, then it changes the sign of your answer, changes the sign of your integral. All right, the second one, the zero width inter interval. If, if the limits of integration are the same, that's like saying your width is from A to A, so there's no width of your rectangles, and so it's gonna be zero. 
If the limits of integration are ever the same, your answer is going to be zero. All right, number three, if you have a constant multiple inside of your integral, you can pull it outside the integral sign. So constant times a function, you can bring the constant in front of the integral. And so sort of a corollary to that would be if you have a negative inside of a function, you can pull the negative out in front. Okay, number four, if you have a sum or difference, then you can do the integral of each term separately. So the integral of f of x plus the integral of g of x, and the limits of integration stay the same. All right. Anybody need any more time on this? Uh, yeah, just a second. Okay. All right, you got it? Uh, yeah, thank just... you. All right, next, okay, is what's called additivity. So here you have the function, the integral, so you got to, this one pays close attention, you got to pay close attention to the limits of integration. So this is saying the integral from A to B plus the integral from B to C would be equal to the integral from A to C. And that's sort of a duh thing when you realize what it's saying. And then the last two uh, just says uh, if, if F has a maximum value and a minimum value, then basically the average value is going to be between the max and the min. Okay? or the function is going to be, see, see the average value is the function divided by B minus A. And so if you multiply everything by B minus A, then the min times the function well, I, I just, just think of, I just like how I said it the first time, the average function, the average value of the function has to be between the maximum and the minimum. And again, that's sort of a duh thing too. Um, of course it has to be. And then the last thing, it says that if, if one function is above another, then its integral is gonna be greater than or equal to. So like if the green function is always above the blue function, then its integral is always gonna be greater because you're talking about the areas. So the area under the green is going to be bigger than the area under the blue. And then the special case is if the function is always greater than zero, then its integral, the area, is always going to be greater than 
zero. And most of the, these last two, yeah, six and seven, I mean, they are important, but it's not, those are not ones that we really use all the time because they're sort of, once you, once you get to doing them a little bit, those are sort of like obvious. That's like saying on a number line, any number to the right of zero is going to be positive. Well, yeah, if you know what a number line is. All right, anybody need more time on those? Okay, so let's look at how we're actually gonna test your understanding of these properties that you just wrote down. Okay, this would be the type of question, okay? So it says, suppose that the integral from negative 2 to 2 of f of x dx is 6, the integral from 2 to 5 of f of x dx is negative 3, and the integral from negative 2 to 2 of g of x is 8, okay? So we don't even know the functions. So what we're doing is testing to see if you understand the properties without getting bogged down in the functions, okay? So this is evaluate the integral from five to two of f of x dx, okay? So this is a question for everyone. How would I do this? How would I find the integral just based on the given information? How would I find that integral from five to two? You would use the information it gives you because it gives you the integral from 2 to 5. And so yeah. since 5, 5 to 2, it's just going to be negative th or uh, the yeah. negative version, so positive 3. So positive 3. So you'll just take the opposite of that number. Because when you're, you're just switching the limits of integration, so you just change the sign of your answer. Okay, beautiful. All right, any questions on that? All right. Let's look at the second one. So now we want uh, the integral uh, from negative 2 to 2, 3 times f of x minus 4 times g of x. All right, so anybody that thinks they, uh, I'll give you a minute. If you think you got the right answer, just call it out. Negative 14. All right. I think you're right. So you say, well, okay, f of x from negative 2 to 2 is 6. So it's a constant times that. So it's just 3 times 6. And then minus 4 times, well, the g of x from negative 2 to 2 is 8. So then you just work that out, and you get negative 14. So great job. All right. Any questions on that?
All right, and then the last one of these type. And this is everborn. When you think you got it, just call it out. Uh, is it three? It is three. Okay. So, because, see, negative two to five, that's the same thing as negative two to two plus two to five. So, from negative two to two, f of x is equal to 6, and from 2 to 5, it's negative 3. Here, let's, I'm going to change the order of that. So it should be 6, plus, so 6 plus negative 3, and so the answer is 3. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay. So let me just tell you straight up, okay? That tests your understanding of these rules, of, but, but in a very simple way. So as a calculus teacher, I like these problems because if you understand, that's an easy problem for you, okay? So I like, I like those types. So I'll just, just leave it at that, okay? All right, number three, finding bounds for an integral. So we still haven't really learned, you know, shortcuts on finding these. So what this is is kind of a check to see if it makes sense, okay? So to find an upper bound, think, is there a number that's greater than or equal to the, the integral? To find a lower bound of an integral, think, is there a number that's less than or equal to the integral? All right. Okay. So this is show that this is greater than six fifths. So if it's going to be greater than six fifths, then what we're saying is, is that six fifths is a lower bound. So this has to be bigger than six fifths. Okay. All right, so then what's the smallest this could be from uh, of this from zero to one? What's the smallest this could be? Well, let's, let me say it a different way. What's smaller, the sine of zero or the sine of one? One. So, so the sine of uh, the sine of zero is smaller than the sine of one. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So what is the sign of zero? Zero. Zero. Okay. So if you think of this as zero, then two plus zero is zero. Square root of two is what? About how much is the square root of two? It's 1.41421. One okay. So then that's the smallest that this could be is the square root of two. 
all right? So if this is the, the square root of 2 is the smallest, then that means that the smallest this could be would be 1.414. 1, 1, so that means it has to be so that 6 fifths is 1.2. So it's a lower bound. There's nothing below, it can't go below six fifths. Because, and actually, 1.414 is the lowest it can go. So when we're trying to calculate upper bounds and lower bounds, you try to think, well, what's the absolute biggest it could be? So what's the biggest this could be? It's 1.685. And how do you get that? I plugged in the equation into my calculator and then went to the table. Okay. And so, so the sign of 1, whatever that is, and then you add 2 to it, take the square root. I bet that's what you, how you got it. Okay. Just plugging it in. That, so that would be the biggest. That would be the maximum the function could be so that when we're talking about the area that's what we're talking about here okay let's see part four okay okay so now the area under the curve so we're going to say this if if the function is non-negative and integrable, integrable, so that means is able to be integrated over a closed curve, then the area under the curve is the integral from A to B. So this, the area under the curve from X equals A to X equals B is the integral from A to B of the function. So that's how we find the area under the curve. If the function is negative, then you take the absolute value of the negative part. Because you can't have negative area. So if you're trying to find the area and the, the function goes below the x-axis, you take the absolute value because that area will still be positive. Okay. Okay, now I, uh, oh, I can't remember if the sheet got changed or not, but um, so for practice four, I think it's, it says negative two on your sheet. You need to change that to a zero. So I want you to find the integral of y equals x cubed on the x-axis from zero to five, okay? So first we're going to set up We're going to set up the integral, okay? So that would be this right here. So this is what we're trying to find. The integral from 0 to 5 of x cubed dx. Okay, now, do you remember at the end of chapter 4, we talked about the integral? All right. So how do we do, we talked about the integral as the antiderivative. So using the anti-power rule, what was the integral of x to the third? What's the antiderivative of x to the third? Okay, remember with the derivative, you bring the number in front and then re reduce the power by one. With the antiderivative, you raise the power by one 
and then divide by that new power. Okay? It's x to the fourth over four, right? Right. x to the fourth over four. Okay, that's the antiderivative. Now, so I want you to, first I want you to write down this integral. So that's a big idea to be able to put it in sort of math lingo here. Write it mathematically. And then, now, when we do the antiderivative, x to the fourth over four, we put that in brackets. And then the limits of integration go on the outside. So zero to five. Okay. Now, to calculate it, we plug in 5 for x minus what we get when we plug in 0 for x. Okay. So see if you can do that. So plug in 5 for x, so the upper limit, minus, then you plug in the lower limit for x, and then you'd subtract. All right, David, what do you get? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. It's 156.25. Okay. All right. Or you could just leave it as a fraction, 625 fourths. So either way, it's perfectly good. Any questions on that? So you plug in the 5, so it's 5 to the 4th over 4, minus, then you plug in the lower limit, 0 to the 4th over 4. So if you were to graph and, you, and obviously we did it without graphing but if you did graph it, see, it would be the area under this curve, okay? The area under the curve. So we're just doing it without adding up all the rectangles. So we're, we're doing it numerically without having to draw all the rectangles, okay? All right. Now, the last thing from this section is average value. So the average or mean value of the function, okay, we did this before, but now we're kind of doing it again. So we're saying, remember average value, you put a little bar over it, so that function average or the average value is 1 over b minus a. So b minus a, that's the interval, times, and then this was the area under the curve, the integral. So this is kind of how I remember it. The average value is the integral over the interval. All right. Okay, so if we know, okay, the average value of the function, okay, so what we do is we set up the integral, 
Okay, so the integral from 0 to pi of cosine x dx, and then it's 1 over, okay, so the interval would be pi minus 0, so 1 divided by pi. All right, now, do you remember, again, this is at the end of chapter 4, when we did those antiderivative formulas. What was the antiderivative of cosine x? Uh, sine x. Sine x, because the derivative of sine x gives you cosine x. So the antiderivative of cosine x gives you sine x, okay? Great, great logic there, or memory, or however you got that, okay? So you put, uh, so 1 over 1 minus, or pi minus 0, so I'm going to just put 1 over pi times, so the antiderivative of cosine x was sine x, and then we're going to evaluate that from zero, from 0 to pi. Okay? So you put in the sine of pi minus the sine of 0, and then work that all out, and then divide by pi. So see if you can finish it off there. So you plug in the top number, Minus plugging in the bottom number. All right, so Nathan, when you've got it, zero. The answer is zero. Okay? Now you might think that's kind of a weird answer, but um, see, cosine, the cosine function is going to, from zero to pi, it, you know, goes like, what, like this? And so its average is right at y equals zero. Because half of the time it's above the x-axis, half the time it's below. Okay? So any questions about that? All right. Well, so just kind of letting you know the big idea then for tomorrow, and it's, I've kind of hinted at it today, is while you have Newton working over here on physics, and the derivative, and Leibniz working on areas under the curve and integrals, then it turns out that the antiderivative and the integral are the same thing. And so these two powerful ideas that were worked separately come together. Okay? And so that's what we're going to work on tomorrow.